Welcome everybody, you're in the right place for Straight Science. And um, to start off with, Straight Science is an evening presentation series put on by UA, University of Alaska Fairbanks Northwest Campus here in Nome, and also UAF, University of Alaska Fairbanks Alaska Sea Grant, also here in Nome, and you're in the home office tonight. UAF Northwest Campus and UAF Alaska Sea Grant, we serve the Bering Strait region, which is the homeland and waters of the Yupik, Inupiaq, and St. Lawrence Island uh, Yupik peoples. And tonight's speaker, I'm really excited because, you know, um, to me, the, the right whale's always been a bit of a great pumpkin and Charlie Brown. I mean, I've never seen one. I always hear they're almost like as bad as the Cook Inlet Belugas for me. I've never seen a Cook Inlet Beluga as many times as I've flown into Anchorage and wandered around looking for them. That said, um, tonight's speaker, really interesting. We never hear about right whales in this region from the science community. And so we're really excited that Jessica's reaching up here to talk with us. And, and also to mention about the right whales here in the Northern Bering Sea. So we're doubly excited about that. Uh, Jessica Krantz is a bioacoustician. So she studies sound and she's with NOAA Fisheries in the Alaska Fisheries Science Center in Seattle. And with that, I think Jessica, I'm just gonna, I have, oh, I'm gonna be learning every time you say something. So take it away. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. And thank you so much to everyone for, for tuning in tonight. Um, I want to just start quickly by acknowledging my family and where I come from. My maternal grandparents, John and Alma Gilliam, my paternal grandparents, Richard and Helen Krantz, and uh, my parents, Chuck and Janet Krantz, and I also have an older sister, Courtney. So just briefly a little bit of background about me. Uh, I was born in Phoenix, Arizona and went to college at the University of Arizona. I then went to graduate school at the University of San Diego where I studied killer whale vocal development. And then after that, I moved up to Seattle and began working at the Marine Mammal Lab with Catherine, in, uh, Catherine Burchock in the acoustics group in the cetacean assessment and ecology program. And a lot of my work at the Marine Mammal Lab has been centered around the North Pacific right well. So I'm really excited to be able to, to share some knowledge with you guys and, and tell you about this species. So right whales are a large baleen whale. They can grow to be about 50 to 60 feet long or so. Um, so this shows the right whale relative to some other marine mammal species. Um, and here it is compared to a human. So they're, they're really large, big whale. They are filter feeders. They eat zooplankton, predominantly copepods and euphausids. And there are three different species of right whales. You have the southern right whale in the southern hemisphere, the North Atlantic right whale, and then you have the North Pacific right whale. And the North Pacific population feeds in the Bering Sea, the Gulf of Alaska, and in Russian waters during the summer months. So the North Pacific right whale is split into two different populations. You have the Western population, which is found primarily in Japanese and Russian waters. And then the Eastern population, which is in the US and Canadian waters. And studies have shown that these two populations are genetically distinct. So even if there is spatial overlap on their feeding grounds, it doesn't appear as though there's any interbreeding between the two populations. And the Western population is thought to number in the low hundreds, maybe between 300 and 500 animals, similar to uh, the situation with the Atlantic right whale. But the Eastern population is the, the one that I'm gonna be focusing on during this talk. So this might be review for some of you, but uh, I just wanted to start with how you distinguish right whales from other species in Alaskan waters. And so they're most known for having these white bumps on the top of their heads called callosities. And so this photo was looking down onto the, the top of the head of a right whale. And so if you zoom in, this is kind of what they look like. They are raised patches of roughened skin that are typically white in color. And if you zoom in even more, what makes the callosities white in color or sometimes orange is that they're actually covered in cyamids or whale lice and they're feeding on those dead patches. 
and so that's what gives them that distinctive kind of white and orange color. It's not the skin itself. It's it's this infestation of cyamids that that doesn't hurt the whale in any way. They're just feeding on that that dead skin. And so the pattern of these callosities is actually unique to each individual right whale. So much like our fingerprints or the fluke patterns of a humpback whale, we can actually tell individuals apart just by looking at the different patterns of these callosities and comparing them to a catalog of known individuals. So if you look at these three photos here and you're looking down again at the, at the top of a, a right whale head, you can see that that pattern of callosities is a little bit different between all three individuals. And this just gives you a, a little bit of a different perspective, uh, also helps to show some of the variation both in the color and, and the pattern of these callosities. And this is how we're able to track individuals over the years is the, these callosities don't ever change. That pattern stays the same throughout their whole life. So we're able to track individuals if we're able to get photos that are a good enough quality to see that pattern. So they're also, uh, they have this kind of characteristic V-shaped blow that you can see here uh, from a couple of different angles. Uh, and so it, it's, it's really distinctive, assuming that there isn't high winds like you guys are having right now. Um, and they also are known for having a, a very wide flat back with no dorsal fin, no ridges or knuckles, um, and they're very dark in color. And then finally, they have these really unique kind of paddle shaped front pectoral fins. And then their flukes are really clean. They have a really nice smooth edge with that deep V right in the middle. So how do they compare with other species in the area? I always find it really helpful to kind of have a side-by-side -side series of photos. Um, and so I think these photos here kind of nicely illustrate some of the differences between a right whale, a bowhead whale, and a gray whale. And so you can see that they, they do look very similar to a bowhead, and they're often referred to up there as the barnacle bowhead. Um, but you can see that main difference are those, those white patches, that those callosities, particularly, you know, at the, the front of the, of the head right up here. Um, and I also put this up here because I, I wanted to mention that right whales do tend to associate very frequently with other species, um, particularly humpback whales and fin whales. So, you know, if you see a large group of whales and one or two in the group don't quite look right, it could be because it's, it's a different species. It could be because it's a right whale because they are very frequently seen with other species. And so I wanted to mention uh, calves very briefly and to, to show what they look like in their development. Um, I should note, we haven't seen a calf in this population in a very long time. So all of the, the photos in the next few slides are from Atlantic right whales. Um, but the gestation period or how long the female is pregnant is right around a year or so, 12 or 13 months. And then calves, when they're born, are approximately 15 feet long and they will nurse and stay closely associated with their mother for uh, about one year. And when they're born, their callosities really haven't developed yet. Uh, so the, the left hand photos, those four photos are of a neonate or a newborn right whale. And so you can see that the head is really pretty smooth. There are no callosities yet, um, no white patches. And also the photo on the right is um, the calf is only about two weeks old, so still really new. Um, and I want to show you this photo because uh, one of the characteristics of a right whale calf is that there's that dip that you can see right before their blowhole. So they have this depression right here. Um, it's kind of referred to by right whale scientists as, as being a shoey head for whatever reason, but that is very characteristic of a calf. And so now these photos on the left are a calf that is a couple of months old. And so you can see that those callosities are developing. They're starting to really get those rough patches, but they're still dark in color. Uh, and then on the right, those two photos, uh, now the calf is around five or six months old. And so now you can really see that those callosities are starting to develop. They're starting to turn white in color because they're getting those cyanids. 
but you still see that kind of depression before their blowhole. Um, and, and so it's, you can start automatically get it, or excuse me, you can start getting those uh, identification photographs of calves at a pretty young age because they do develop those callosities pretty quickly. Um, and, and again, I wanted to mention calves because we haven't seen one in, these pop in this population for 16 years or so. Um, so any sighting of a right wall calf would be extremely rare and really, really important. Uh, and we would love to be able to get photos and to document that. So why haven't we seen a calf? Why are these animals so rare? Well, they were once uh, distributed widely throughout the entire Bering in the North Pacific, but then they became the primary target of commercial whaling beginning in the early 1800s. And it's estimated that somewhere between 26 and 37,000 animals were taken, with the majority of that occurring in only just a couple of decades. And so this brought the population down to maybe somewhere in the high hundreds of animals. Uh, and it was thought that then the, the population might have been starting to recover, but then the Soviets began illegally whaling in the early 1960s. And in just a handful of years, they took over 700 additional animals and that just decimated what was left of the Eastern population and brought them down to what we think are their current numbers. So what are those numbers? What's the current population size? Uh, so this map shows all of the sightings that uh, occurred in the Eastern Bering in the Gulf of Alaska from 1980 to 2003. So in, in 23 years, we only had a handful of sightings, most of which occurred in the Southeastern Bering. So some surveys that were conducted in the Bering Sea in the early 2000s, they came up with a population estimate of only around 30 individuals. And of that, only an estimated eight are females. Uh, so there are more people on the Zoom call right now than there are estimated female uh, right whales in the Bering Sea. Um, and, and of those 30 animals, uh, it's you know, roughly a, a two to one male bias ratio. That was the original estimate. But you know, a recent study just showed that the ratio was in fact closer to three to one male biased, which unfortunately that's, that's the opposite ratio you want if you're trying to rebuild a population. So because of their low, low population size and because of the areas where they have been most commonly seen in recent decades, uh, areas in the Southeastern Bering and near Kodiak Island were designated as critical habitat for this population in 2008. And those are the, the polygons with the, the red hatched lines in there. Um, so we know that they can be found in these areas in the summer every year. But what we don't know is where these animals go when or even if they leave their feeding grounds their migration routes and their calving grounds are still unknown. Um, you know, even, even the old whaling log books uh, from the captains mentioned that there was no evidence of breeding or calving grounds. So we suspect that they migrate south in winter like a, a lot of large baleen whale species, but we don't know what those migration routes are or where they go. So there have been uh, a couple dozen sightings in the past few decades that have occurred in Southern California and Baja. And there was one high to low latitude match of a right whale that was first seen in Hawaii in April of 1996. That was then later recited in the Bering Sea only a few months later in July. And so this was the first and still to this day, the only evidence of a migration of a right whale. Um, because none of the animals sighted off the West Coast have really ever been recited. But recently, we did a marine mammal survey just this past summer in the northern Gulf of Alaska, and we actually found two pairs of right whales that were sighted near Kodiak Island, and those two yellow stars there mark the locations of those two sightings. So going into a little bit of detail about these, the first sighting uh, was on the 21st of August of two animals. And one animal was confirmed as new and was added to the catalog. And it's always really exciting when we get to add a new individual. And the other animal 
was actually matched to an animal that had first been sighted by uh, DFO Canada off Haida Gwaii in June, just a couple months before that on June 12th. And DFO was able to obtain a biopsy sample from this animal. So once those analyses are complete, we'll be able to tell the sex of that individual. And then the other sighting was on the 24th of August. These two animals were found using passive acoustics. And again, one animal was confirmed as new and added to our catalog. And the second animal was matched to a known individual, catalog number 71. And this animal was first seen in Barnabas Trough, uh, which was about 80 miles away where the, where the first sighting was. And that was the first time that this animal had ever been recited. So it's always great when we can add a recite to an animal and we know that they're still around. Hey, uh, Jessica, this is Gay. I'm just yeah. wondering if you can if you can maybe just quickly go over what when you say biopsy was obtained and, and kind of what you're learning from that. That that yeah. might help. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the reminder. So uh, a biopsy sample is when we can obtain a small plug of skin and blubber from the animal. It's typically collected using a crossbow. Um, and so you shoot a dart at the animal and it just kind of pops off their skin and you're able to collect a, a little piece of their skin and blubber. And from that sample, you can tell um, not only the, the sex of the animal, whether it's male or female, you can tell uh, reproductive status of the animal, you can tell what stock it's from, whether it's Eastern or Western population. Um, and so biopsy samples are, are difficult to obtain, especially with these animals. They're, they're pretty evasive once vessels get in the area but you can, you can get a lot of information about the animal itself if you are lucky enough to obtain a biopsy sample. So uh, DFO was able to get a, a sample from the animal that they saw off Haida Gwaii. Um, so that will tell us a, a lot about this animal, whether it's male or female, uh, whether it's, it's uh, a, a mature and reproducing animal. Uh, so really fantastic results from that. So, but why, why are these results so exciting? Um, one of the best things about them is, you know, we suspect that the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska right whales represent two different subgroups of the Eastern population. Um, but sightings are really so infrequent that it's difficult to determine whether this is actually the case or not. Uh, we have never matched an animal seen in the Bering Sea to an animal seen in the Gulf of Alaska. And we've only had that one high to low latitude match of the animal from Hawaii. Um, and prior to this survey, we've never matched an animal from the Gulf of Alaska or from Haida Gwaii to anywhere else. But now we have that link between the Northern Gulf near their critical habitat to the British Columbia coast. And so this suggests that perhaps these two subgroups have different migratory routes with the Bering Sea animals migrating south to Hawaii and the Gulf animals staying along the west coast. But unfortunately with an N of one, with only having one animal in either group, it's difficult to really make any conclusions, uh, especially again, since none of the sightings off California or Baja have, have ever been matched anywhere. Uh, but really exciting results to finally be able to link Haida Gwaii and, and British Columbia to the Gulf of Alaska. So why not put a satellite tag on these animals, right? To try and, and see where their migration routes are, see where they're going. So we did that in 2004 and in 2008 and nine. And while the tags were successful and we did get a lot of really useful information on their fine scale habitat use, unfortunately, all of the tags fell out before the animals left the Bering Sea. And so it, it left that question of their migration routes unanswered. So, so why do we still know so little about these animals? Why is it so difficult to study them? So I always like to look at, at the Atlantic right well for comparison. Their entire migration route is along the US East Coast. So at any given time of the year, you can head out somewhere along the East Coast and see right whales. Uh, and so because of that ease of accessibility, they are extremely well studied uh, and a well-known population. They know what the trends are. They know who is reproducing. Um, and they are regularly in the public eye. 
Our population, however, it lives in a much more logistically difficult area. It's, it's a good distance from the nearest port to reach their critical habitat. Um, and as many of you here know, uh, it is an area known for having rough seas, thick fog at the best of times. Um, for, for reference, that little blob right there is a right whale head <laughs> in thick fog. So that, that's often what a lot of our photographs look like. Um, and the area is, is covered in ice for a good portion of the year. So even though vessel surveys are a really great way to obtain information, because of the logistical difficulties in getting there, full-scale surveys are kind of few and far between. Uh, so one of the best ways that we are able to study these animals is using passive acoustics. So North Pacific right whales, uh, at least our population, they primarily make three types of calls. And the first is called the gunshot call, and that's seen in the top photo. And it, it's an impulsive sound. It, it sounds very much like it's named. And this is the predominant call type for the population. And so I'm going to go ahead and play this clip, and hopefully this comes through. So hopefully that came through. Um, that is their predominant call type. That is the one that they use most frequently. They also make a call type known as an up sweep or an up call. This one's a little bit more faint, so I'll play it a couple times. One more time. So hopefully you heard that. Um, if not, let me know and I can uh, replicate it for you. And then they'll also make a variety of other calls like, a, you did? Oh, good, excellent. Thanks, Kay, appreciate that. Um, and then this last one here uh, is a, a type of moan, a down sweep. They'll make another variety of, of moans and other kind of tonal calls. So those are the, the three main call types for this animal. So if you're hearing those, particularly the gunshot, then that's a pretty good indication that you have a right well. So while we're out at sea on our vessel surveys trying to find right whales, we will use an instrument called a sauna buoy and that uh, it floats in the water with this kind of orange triangle float at the top and there's an antenna in there. And then it has a series of hydrophones hanging below it down in the water. And this will transmit in real time any sounds that are occurring. So if a whale starts calling, we hear it as it happens. And the other great thing with the sauna buoy is that it has directional capabilities. So if we do start hearing a right whale, we can deploy multiple sauna buoys at once. So in this example, I have two sauna buoys in, one coming in on the top channel and another one coming in the bottom. And you can actually localize on the calls, get bearings from each of those sauna buoys and triangulate the whale's position. And then from there, you can direct the boat to that position um, and here's a, a, an example of the, our, our plotting software. This was designed by Catherine. And so you can see these blue lines are our bearings to the whale. Um, and so in this case, the whale happened to be kind of right here in the middle. So we can give that position to the captain. They'll direct the boat, excuse me, to the area. And then from there, the visual observers can sight the animal and then we can, can continue to work it and get photo ID photographs. And so this has really been instrumental in, in helping us locate right whales and increase the number of sightings during our survey and the, the amount of time spent in the area of a right whale. Another aspect of our research is our long-term passive acoustic monitoring. So we have been deploying year-long acoustic recorders at over 20 different sites throughout Alaskan waters beginning in uh, 2007 and continuing to this day. So these instruments will record to an internal hard drive for a full year. And then at that point, we can retrieve them and uh, analyze the data. We'll put a new one out. And so by listening to what calls are, are present on the recorders, then we can determine what uh, we can determine the presence of marine mammal species, their migration and movement patterns, 
Uh, we can tell whether their distribution patterns are changing as a result of climate change. So it's really a useful tool for, for population monitoring. Uh, and one of, the, one of the best benefits is that it can monitor year round during times when vessel surveys aren't possible. So I just want to go through some of the results from our long-term monitoring. Uh, so this plot here shows right whale calling presence at one location over time, in this case over two years, starting in September of 2014 and going through September of 2016. And the black lines are the right whale calling presence. And here, so that, that means it's the percentage of 10 minute intervals per day with calls. So 100% calling activity, or if the black bars hit 100%, that means that every 10 minute interval of recordings for that day had at least one right well call. And so the blue line there is your percent ice concentration. And then the gray section is anywhere where we don't have data. And so in this plot here, you can see we have really consistent right well presence in the summer and fall months. So now let's zoom out and include multiple moorings and multiple years. So now you're looking at the same kind of plot, but nine different locations over a total of six years. And I've color coded the moorings along the side to the map. And then I've also arranged them latitudinally just for uh, ease of viewing purposes. And so this is a really nice example of, of the long-term time series that we can get for different species. Um, in this case, you know, right whales in their, in their habitat in the Southern Bering Sea. And so what you'll notice is that we have consistent annual detections of right whales in the summer months um, in, the, in the Southeastern Bering Sea, particularly in their critical habitat. However, we've also seen an uptick in detections at our Northern Bering, Bering Sea locations in recent years. And so we wanted to look a little bit more closely at these detections and see how they related to oceanographic conditions. So Zerbini et al. found that uh, during a strong cold pool year, and what I mean by that is, is leftover winter water that, that sits at the bottom and remains during summer. Uh, so in years where they had a strong cold pool year, the right whales uh, had much more restricted movements and used a much smaller area within their critical habitat. But in years where the cold pool was weak or wasn't present, they were much more widely distributed. And so he hypothesized that the, the cold pool tends to concentrate their zooplanktonic prey into a much smaller area, whereas the warmer conditions resulted in their prey being much more widely distributed. And so the whales then by extension were also widely distributed. So now if we look at our acoustic data through the lens of these kind of cold pool years, here now I've highlighted the, in the blue section those years where we had uh, an extensive summer cold pool all the way down to the southeastern bearing. And the red highlight are years when the cold pool was either not there or was only limited to the northern bearing. And so you can see that those years where we had warmer conditions were typically the years where we had a lot more acoustic detections in the northern bearing. And this corresponds really well with what uh, Zerbini et al. found. Oop, hang on. Sorry. And this also corresponds really nicely to the right well sighting reports that have been submitted to Gay. And so while there were a couple of sightings in earlier years, in 2005 and 2012, there have been quite a few reports in recent years, uh, several in 2018, in 2019, um, and these are all during the warm period, which also corroborates Zerbini et al. So, you know, these sightings that, that you guys report to Gay are really appreciated. Um, they really, they, they help us better understand their distribution, um, you know, you guys are up there year round during times when we can't be up there. And so these sightings are really, really useful for us. But of course, like all things with right whales, there are complications and challenges that come with it. Uh, so I mentioned that right whales will produce gunshot calls and up calls. Well, bowhead whales also make these two call types uh, and, and they can be impossible to distinguish either spectrographically or orally. Uh, so this plot here, the spectrogram, shows uh, almost four minutes of recordings 
This is from a Northern Bering Sea site. And, and what you're looking at are basically bowhead whale songs. So all these, these kind of upside down V-shaped calls, this is all bowhead song. Uh, however, <laughs> right in the middle of this bowhead whale song are three textbook right whale up calls. Um, so were these produced by a bowhead that also make up calls or were these right whales? And so if you go back to that long, or our plot of long-term acoustic detections, you can see now in these highlighted red sections that a lot of these right whale detections have occurred under the ice and in winter when bowhead whales are also present. So as of right now, all of these detections that are under the ice, we refer to as ambiguous or maybe calls because we don't know whether they were produced by right whales or bowheads. But there are a couple of ways that we're hoping we can figure this out. So one of the ways is by looking at song. So while we were analyzing our long-term recorder data in the Bering Sea, we started noticing kind of these repeating stanzas of gunshot calls that were really regular and really patterned. But then on top of that, we also noticed that this more complicated beginning portion also lined up really well and was, was becoming stereotyped. So we started looking into these patterns in more detail. And what we found is that these gunshots were being produced in a manner very similar to humpback whale song. So they have this hierarchical structure where several gunshots will produce a phrase, several phrases will comprise a theme, and many themes in turn create a song that is then repeated for several hours. And to date, we have found four different unique song types in the Bering Sea that are all comprised almost entirely of gunshot calls that are occurring in the summer and fall months when other right whale detections are also occurring. And not only that, but they demonstrate remarkable long-term stability. So humpback whale songs will change every year, but these right whale songs have been proven to be remarkably consistent. So this one song type has remained the same over the eight years of the study that we've found them so far. And furthermore, this bottom song here was localized out in the field to two male right whales. So we know for sure these are right whales. We know for sure that males are singing. And so that leads us to think that perhaps these are a reproductive display, which is the case for song and other species like humpbacks and bowheads. But so far, this gunshot song hasn't been documented with, with bowheads. They do gunshot, but it's much less frequently. Um, their song, bowhead songs, are comprised of tonal calls and other frequency modulated calls. They're not comprised of gunshots. So right now, this is one real clear way to distinguish between a right whale and a bowhead during those periods where there is ambiguity and the, the two species do overlap. But what's really interesting is that during the same summer survey where we had the four right whale sightings, we actually detected song in that second right whale encounter, but it was slightly different than the songs that we have seen in the Bering Sea data. So we're still in the process of analyzing our current Bering Sea data to see if this new version of a song also occurs there, or if it might be unique to the Gulf of Alaska subgroup. And if it is unique to the Gulf, then that really raises a lot of fascinating questions about song production and transmission within the species and between these two subgroups. And to date, this population, the Eastern right whale, is still the only population of right whales known to sing. This hasn't yet been documented in the other species or in the other populations. So what are some of the other research uh, projects that we have going on? So in an effort to broaden our acoustic spatial coverage, <clears throat> excuse me, we are collaborating with DFO Canada and analyzing some of their moorings uh, off British Columbia to monitor for right whales in the hopes that it might provide some insight into uh, migration patterns and migration routes. So we're analyzing these moorings using an automated detection and classification system uh, known as Instinct. This was developed in-house by one of our analysts. Uh, and this is also a, a proof of concept project to determine whether 
an auto detector that was designed for the Bering Sea could be implemented into a different area. And if this proves successful, then this may allow us to really quickly analyze large data sets in other areas and other parts of the Pacific. So these next few slides are describing some work being done by another team member, Dana Wright. Uh, this is all part of her PhD research project uh, at Duke University. And so I've mentioned that we, we don't know what the migration routes and patterns are. Uh, well, Dana is hoping to explore this using stable isotope analyses. Uh, so by measuring the stable isotopes in baleen, you can get a continuous multi-year ecological history of an individual using those carbon and nitrogen isotope values to explore those migratory patterns. Um, and so she's hoping that that might elucidate where these animals have gone historically. And she's also received, uh, recently obtained baleen well plates from Kodiak, from unknown species, either belonging to a bowhead or a right whale. So she's also in the process of analyzing those plates to uh, determine species and then hopefully add to her data set of right whale plates. And in addition to the isotope work, she's also hoping to leverage some lower trophic level data sets to try and explore where right whales may be on the Bering Shelf in areas where we don't have acoustic recorders. So right whales feed primarily on Calanus copepods, which are also the predominant prey for many forage fish species. And those are uh, much more readily available, those samples are. So she's hoping to determine whether these lower trophic level data sets can be used in a joint species distribution model to conditionally predict where right whales may be occurring on the middle and outer domains of the Bering Sea Shelf. Um, and then from that, we can then target, uh, better target our acoustic monitoring efforts to those areas. And some of Dana's earlier work focused on trying to uh, attribute ambiguous calls to species. So those calls where we don't know if it was a right whale or a bowhead. And one of the ways that this can be done is using a process called nonlinear time warping. So this photo on the left is of a gunshot call that is, uh, it was produced, it was really far from the acoustic recorder. And so you can see it's got this kind of feathering here, kind of looks like a broom down at the bottom. Um, and so you can analyze the different modes of these calls coming in and use this time warp processing to determine the depth and the range of a calling animal. Uh, and it's, it's thought that right whales and bowheads may call at different depths with right whales primarily calling near the surface and then bowheads calling at a deeper depth. So using this method, we can then estimate the depth and the range to the caller as seen in this plot here. It's, you know, looks like the call is approximately eight kilometers away and in the top 10 meters of the, of the water column. Um, and so hopefully this will help elucidate which species is the caller. Uh, unfortunately, this process is very time consuming. So the next step in this research for Dana is to work with other graduate students at Duke University and Woods Hole to attempt to use machine learning to automate that time warping process so that we can obtain those depth and range estimates uh, while cutting down on that extensive processing time. Um, so the added benefits to that too is that that could then be applied to all of the right whale call detections and that would allow us to obtain an, an abundance estimate for the eastern population using our acoustic data. Uh, and that would also help us to estimate uh, recorder detectability, uh, you know, in other words, how far the recorder can hear whales, and as well as quantifying the impact of noise on right whale detectability, which has a lot of management implications, especially considering the increase in vessels. So one last aspect that I, I wanted to highlight was, again, how important these opportunistic sightings are to us. We really do rely quite heavily on, on sightings and reports of right whales since we can't be out surveying all the time. So, you know, anyone out on the water can be eyes for us. Uh, and these sightings really help to increase our knowledge of right whale spatiotemporal distribution. Uh, and so I wanna highlight a recent sighting um, in early February, just last month, some commercial cod fishermen 
saw, uh, saw a couple of what they said were, you know, weird looking whales doing this strange behavior that they hadn't noticed before. And they reached out to the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and said, hey, what are these? And they said, ooh, we don't really know. And uh, the emails made their way over to us. And, and we said, wow, you know, that's, that's a right whale. And, and this sighting was really, really unique as this is the first sighting of a right whale feeding in the Bering Sea in winter. Uh, you know, we have acoustic detections of right whales in the Bering Sea through January, but this is the first confirmed visual sighting over winter. And so this, this really kind of helped answer some of those questions that, you know, perhaps some portion of the population is remaining in the Bering Sea over winter. And, uh, and within a few days of that sighting making its way to us, you know, we had worked with colleagues from several branches of the government. Uh, we got a, a Coast Guard notice sent out to mariners, uh, as well as an automated AIS notice. So any vessel that has active AIS, when it entered that blue polygon area, they would automatically get an alert and a message alerting them to the presence of right whales and asking them to reduce their speed and to keep an extra lookout and to report any additional sightings to me. So, you know, these and other reported sightings really do help us kind of piece together that puzzle of their, their range, their overwinter distribution and their migration patterns. And so I just want to wrap up by reiterating that the reports of right whales in the Northern Bering that, that Gay passes along to us are extremely valuable. And, and so please continue to, to call and email Gay with any right whales that might be sighted. Um, you know, please note if you can, the date and time, the location, the number of animals, and if possible, their behavior, whether they're feeding. Um, and if there's any possible way to get a photo or video of the animals, that would be extremely helpful um, because then that might allow us to match the animals to our catalog of known individuals. And so then we can determine whether it's a new individual or uh, whether it's a, an individual that we know and, and are now reciting. So it helps us to track individuals and their population trends. Um, and then finally too, uh, if you see a stranded right whale, that also presents a lot of really useful information for us. We can, we can learn a lot from, from stranded animals. So please also report any strandings that you may come across. And with that, uh, thank you everyone so much for your time and for tuning in. And uh, I will happily take any questions you might have. All right, well, thank you so much. Holy cow, Jessica, I learned tons. And for the, for the street science crowd, everybody here is pretty good about making sure that um, kudos go in the chat box for Jessica. It's never easy to be a public speaker ever. <laughs> And, uh, and I already kind of was saying things like, well, it was kind of breezy and we lost our phone earlier and it's back on again. And so, um, you know, just to make it nerve wracking even more so for her. So thank you, Jessica, you did a great job. And, um, and so I know I've got lots of questions, um, but we do have a caller and callers get preference here in Nome because they're usually calling from outside of Nome. So if I see the caller, it's again, hard to, Hard to be a caller on a Zoom call. If you have any question, feel free to uh, unmute yourself. It might be in star six, and then you'd be unmuted and ask away. Awesome. Uh, I am asking away. So this is Rafael okay. Simomaya up in uh, from Barrow, actually. Um, I just ran out of in, in, you know internet, so that's why I have to call. <laughs> A really great presentation. Um, so my question is really, um, since it was a cod fishing boat, how close were they to those white whales? So they so were, they, you know, called it in. Yeah, yeah, they they got within, uh, I, I think, a, a, about a couple hundred yards or so of the of the right whales. But the group of animals that the right whales were with. Uh, they they mentioned that they were seen with about eight to ten other pairs of animals, um, and some of the other photographs that they sent in showed uh, humpback whales up really close. And so they, it, you know, we do suspect that they were mixed in with a group of humpback whales. Um, but yeah, it, it seems like they, you know, they got good enough photos for us to be able to identify two species, uh, but the the photos weren't quite a good enough quality for us to identify individuals. 
Okay, and, and then one more question I'm just gonna shoot. So are we concerned about bycatch? And then I'll stop. Thank you. It's yeah, you know, uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, entanglement and vessel strikes are, are absolutely real threats to this population. Um, the problem that we have is, is quantifying exactly what that risk is uh, and, and what the effects are on the population. Because the number of recites of these animals is so low from year to year, you know, we'll often go several years without seeing a single animal. Um, and, and, you know, because of the remote nature of, of the area, it's entirely possible that if an animal were to become entangled, um, they might die before it ever is, is noticed or reported. So they are certainly real threats. Uh, there is quite a bit of overlap between vessel activity and their habitat. Um, but as of right now, we've had difficulty in actually quantifying them. Thank you. Yeah, I was just curious just because, uh, you know, it's such, it's so unusual, you know, that it's been seen, but it's also because you had boats out there and they are, you know, engaging in fishing. So it's kind of doing the, you know, spatial temporal overlap between a highly endangered, um, you know, whale and fishing activity. And I know that's a great concern in a way, you know, anyway, interactions um, down in the Bering Strait. Thank you very much. I'll, Thank you. I'll mute myself again. All right, and and um, since you're a caller, Raffaella, you get you get full run of the house. You can just blurt out at any time, so take advantage of that. <laughs> Callers are are a precious commodity. They're really trying to get on. So there's questions in the chat box. Uh, one is from Jim Dory. Given the low numbers, the poor male female ratio, is there any hope for these animals to rebound? It's a great question. It's one I am asked a lot. Um, you know, the optimist in me says, yes, there is always hope. Um, we have added quite a few new individuals to our catalog in recent years. So it seems that every time we do surveys, we're finding new animals and adding to our catalog. Um, we, we don't have a more recent uh, population abundance estimate. So we don't know whether that magic number of 30 animals still holds. We don't know what the trends are for this population, um, but it, it's, a, it's a big ocean. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, I suspect that there are a few more animals out there and, and yeah, it's, it, I think there, there's always hope assuming that we can, we can do what we can for these animals. Yeah. All right, I see Peter, you have your hand up, go ahead. And we've got questions in the chat too. Uh, there were plenty in the chat before me. Go ahead with some of those other ones first, Kay. All right. So um, from Rob Kaler, great job, Jessica. Can hydrophones be used to quantify vessel traffic, which is a potential collision hazard for whales, and how many and how vessel traffic may impact right whales and all large whales? Yeah, great question. Um, our recorders do pick up vessel noise, uh, and so we we are able to to plot those two together and see what kind of overlap there is. Um, and then if you look at the AIS data for those vessels, then you can actually link specific vessels to the area, so you can actually quantify the number of vessels that are around. Um, so yes, that is that is very much a possibility with our data set. With regards to the, the threats and the problems, um, you know, obviously ship strike is, is one of the biggest ones, but also just the increase in noise to their, to their habitat. Um, if there are so few animals, you know, they rely very heavily on acoustic communication to, to stay in contact. So the more vessels that are in the area, the more noise that's in the habitat, the, the smaller their acoustic communication space becomes, the, the less distance they are able to be heard by their conspecifics. Um, and that, that holds true really for, for any marine mammal, um, but in particular, those that are you know, solitary animals and so few in number. So yeah, it, it's, it's quite an issue for them. All right, so thank you for that. And I think, in the chat, there's another one. How is about pollution? So I'll just skip to the noise. How is noise pollution uh, from, from Jenny? How is noise pollution in the sea hindering any sourcing of acoustic records of right whales, if at all? That's sort of getting at the same. The yeah, noise. yeah. 
so yeah, it, it you know it kind of touches on the same subject. Um, you know, we a, a great example is we have an acoustic recorder in Unimac Pass, um, and that is a, a pass in the Aleutian Islands chain. That's part of the Great Circle Route for for commercial shipping lanes. Um, just a, a huge amount of vessel traffic goes through that pass every day, and uh, and, and yeah, it it we have seen evidence of masking of calls because of ship noise in that area. So it really can, if there are enough vessels and the noise is loud enough, it, it can hinder our ability to detect these animals. Hope that answers that, Jenny. Um, and then Linda Shaw, what are the implications of climate change to these whales? And Jenny says, yes, that was a good answer. Thank you. Oh, great. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, yeah, you know, one of the biggest uh, implications is, is we've already kind of seen evidence of right whales moving further north in the Bering Sea, particularly with these warmer years. You know, we, we've seen this pattern of cold pool years and colder years, the right whales remain more uh, densely within their, their critical habitat in the southeastern Bering, but in the warmer years, it is redistributing their prey and we're seeing them farther north in the Bering. So as the, the climate continues to change and the conditions continue to warm in the Bering Sea, we could potentially see an expansion of their range farther north. That's interesting to mm -hmm. consider. Um, yeah. Peter, Peter, your electronic hand, you've been patiently waiting. Great, <laughs> thank your, you. Yeah. Um, super, super interesting. Um, I have a question that I fear might um, be a little bit too much towards um, Dana's research, um, mm -hmm. but I, I happened to be having this conversation today with someone else. Um, the isotope, um, the, the, the isotope detection is that, um, so there was a straight science a couple of weeks ago on the Alaska hair and they were doing genomic sequencing. They don't even know what the Alaska hare eats. And so they were doing genomic sequencing of pellet samples to kind of reverse, yeah. reverse engineer what they're eating. Um, and I'm wondering if the isotope detection is something similar. And if not, could it be possible um, to kind of reverse engineer? It can be used in watersheds a lot. So I'm wondering if, if, if you could reverse engineer um, to kind of triangulate the migration routes based on what they've eaten, based on what you find in them? Um, yeah, that, that's actually exactly right. So um, baleen, it, you, you create kind of these plates within one plate of baleen. It's kind of like tree rings and uh, these they remain stable in the baleen. And so you can look at the stable isotopes within each of those rings in a plate, let's call it. Um, and, and those isotope values change depending on the uh, oceanographic conditions and the prey availability in the area that you are in. So we can analyze all of those rings throughout time and see whether you know it, it, it changed from um, more of a nitrogen-based signal down to a carbon-based, uh, depending on oceanographic conditions at the time. So we're hoping, or I guess I should say Dana is hoping that she can analyze those and maybe see this evidence of migration to these different parts of the North Pacific using those different signals uh, within the, the baleen plates. Did that help? Yes, I'm glad I understood it correctly. Um, and, and I'm sorry to only direct a question toward Dana. Everyone already asked my noise pollution question because I also did a story <laughs> about that recently. So just- Not uh, a problem. No, I was going to do that too. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Not a problem. Really interesting. And right, so Peter, you. Peter, if it helps for bowhead, which is the right whale's first cousin, this, this question you have of migration, as they're laying down their baleen, which is like a fingernail material, and it's coming out of their mouth over time, it is, you can actually track uh, when they're in the Bering Sea versus when they're in the Beaufort Sea over mm -hmm. time. So, so it's, it's a really great question. Yeah. Um, and Wes has his hand up. Go ahead, Wes. Uh, my, my first question, real simple, is what's the life expectancy or the you know, average to oldest uh, age class of these animals that you're seeing? And then my yeah. next question is, being it that the northern is so short, is so shallow, 
is is and and that you knuck, neck down at the at the Bering Strait. Do you, what's your thoughts about them eventually going into the Chukchi, and or is that a hindrance? Because it looks like most of their stuff is in deeper, more open water. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the first question, uh, the the short answer is we don't fully know. Um, the the best way. We think they can live to be at least around 70 years old. Um, and a lot of this information is kind of based on the Atlantic right well because they're much better studied. Um, so, so we think they can live at least 70 years old. They are pretty closely related to a, a bowhead whale. So uh, we know bowhead whales can live to be quite old, you know, 150 years plus, I believe. So, you know, it, I, I don't think it's un, unheard of or out of the question to think that right whales may also live to to you know, be a hundred or, or more, but, uh, but we still don't know at this point. Um, so with regards to the second question, there have been reports in the past of a couple of right whales sighted north of the strait over in the Russian side of the Southern Chukchi. Um, there is some question as to the validity of those reports because they are so old as to whether they were right whales versus bowhead. Um, Historically, they were distributed in some pretty deep waters, but um, most of the sightings in the past few decades have all been in pretty shallow waters, and most often they're found in the Bering Sea on in shallow waters, um, usually around kind of the, the 40 to 70 meter range. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's uh, out of the question for them to potentially make their way further north into the Chukchi if that's how oceanographic conditions and their prey distribution uh, ends up moving to. Mm -hmm. Does that answer that, Wes? Yeah, thank you. Yep. Okay. All thank right. You. Anyone else? I've got a couple questions. Anyone else with a question, burning question for Jessica? Jessica, your fantastic presentation and lots of interest in right whales, which I'm really interested in right whales. So here's my question then. So for the one that was biopsied up here, you know, all things kind of come to the Bering Strait region and you have mm -hmm. your Western stock and you have your Eastern stock is what it sounds like. And the Western are kind of doing better. I mean, you know, if you can call like 300 better, but better than <laughs> maybe whatever you said, 30 to 50 right. on our side. So up here, what was the whale off St. Lawrence Island? Did they do the genetics? Was it a? Yep, that was Eastern. Oh, it was, was an Eastern. Eastern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was an Eastern right whale. So uh, that was definitely much that? our population. Yeah, yeah. So we were able to That's obtain a biopsy sample um, and, and that animal. So for, for those who are unaware, there was an animal that was uh, sighted just about seven miles, I think, south of the west end of St. Lawrence in uh, late July of 2018. Um, and we were able to get uh, photo ID photographs and a biopsy sample from that animal. And then that animal is actually recited about three weeks later up in the waters of Chukotka in Bering Strait uh, by a wow. Russian charter organization. And, uh, and so that was really fascinating too, to know that the animal was sticking around in the area and making its way even further north than, than when we saw it. Um, and, and yeah, so that, that animal was, was from the Eastern population, not Western. Wow, that's interesting because given the mm -hmm. numbers, that's even more uh... Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we, think, we think that the Western population may not come all the way up into the the northern bearing, but but again, that's 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 part of the question, um, and and so uh, it's it's entirely possible that they are overlapping on their feeding grounds. Yeah, um, and my other question is the roughened skin, the callosity. The callosities. Mm -hmm. What is its function? <laughs> What and that poor calf with his little dish in head and he's got he's already it must be itchy or and then you've got the whale the siamids which are the whale lice so I'm curious is, is there any known function for that tissue on the head and my second question is into this the whale lice you said they're known mm -hmm. to feed on the skin is mm -hmm. that they're known to feed on the skin that's a mm -hmm. that's a known okay oh, yep. that's interesting yeah. too. Yeah. So yeah. So that's 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 why they kind of end up covered in diameter that, that stay there. Is they just they they park it on those callosities and and just kind of slowly eat eat the the dead skin there. Um, function as to the 
As to the function, I have no idea. That is a yeah. great question. Um, I, as far as I know, there haven't been any studies to exfoliation. Yeah, um, there haven't been any studies. I think that have found any any function for them. Um, you know, there are uh, below that big callosity on the front of its nose. There are some tiny itty bitty little hairs on on right well noses. Um, and those have been kind of thought to, to, to play a function in, in foraging. Um, they think they can maybe sense some patches and, and oceanographic conditions. Um, but as to the callosities themselves, I, I have no clue. It's a handy thing to be able to distinguish between bowhead, given the, the little glimpse you get of a, of a big whale yep. as it's traveling in your water. So that's actually really handy. Bowhead yeah. also have that little patch of hair there and uh, mm -hmm. same same thing. So actually that generated a question in the chat box. So are the species of whale lice um, endangered as well? Ooh, I have no idea. That's a really good question. Like I, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. And, and um, for the other question, are there species of whale lice found on other whale species? There are, I don't know if you want to address there that. There are, yes. Yeah. So, so there are, uh, well, first of all, other right whale species also have cyamids. So there are some that are specific to the Atlantic uh, and specific to the Southern, um, but gray whales are also completely covered in cyamids on the regular. So a lot of the, the white um, bumps and different. things on, on gray whales. Mm -hmm. Yeah, different. different, very different, but um, also covered in, in, in cyamids. Uh, and bowheads have also on occasion uh, shown to have infestations of cyamids, not, not, not constantly like the right whale callosities do. Um, but yeah, so they are, they are frequently found on other species. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think actually yeah, for perhaps. permit pur purposes with bowhead anyway, I'm more familiar with bowhead, those cyamids are considered part of uh, endangered as well. So when you're dealing with uh, oh. the permit issues, I Interesting. think, yeah. Yeah, I, I admit to not in any way being a cyamid expert. <laughs> so, well, the, the uh, North Slope yeah. Borough Department of Wildlife Management actually does it quite a bit on, um, they do some research on cyamids and bowhead. So it's, it's very interesting. So if you're interested oh, nice. in that uh, contact, at Utjagvik, the North Slope Borough Department of Wildlife Management. Usually on bowheads are so sleek and beautiful, you'll only usually see them if there's an injury, mm -hmm. you know, that deforms the surface of the water. So it sort of stops, like they get a big, big lumpy scar. As they're swimming forward, there's an eddy in the back that allows them sure. sort of a, a habitat to get in there and hang on. And, but I, sure. that's why I was asking about eating the skin. Um, it's interesting, it might be different yeah. for different sites. Yeah. And then my last question, and thanks everybody for participating. My last question is because we live in the Bering Strait, we're seeing this crazy traffic situation into January. Now, what's happening right now in world stage is, um, you know, we don't know what's, there's a lot of unknowns, but um, there's been some articles recently about the sanctions affecting some of the ship building and the Northern Sea Route. But, you know, we're only into this in like, the second week but mm -hmm. we're seeing more and more and more large vessel traffic thousand foot tankers um, 570 foot nuclear powered icebreakers uh, yeah. large other types of large commerce we have commercial fishing now that's going large uh, pollock trawler processor types going up into the chukchi in the summer months and vessel traffic right into the ice covered months into end of january we've seen vessel traffic into february they haven't come in march and april yet but um, that's coming, is what they tell us, very soon. Is, is the, um, I don't know, is there any part of the right will lab addressing sort of sensitive areas? I mean, I know Unimac Pass, where same thing, where you have all these ships much mm -hmm. on a daily basis going through these narrows, um, just south of that critical habitat where you showed in off Bristol Bay. Um, are you guys looking north at all into any of that, this situation when it comes to right whales in the Fishery Science Center? 
Yeah, yeah, we we have uh, recorders up in the Bering Strait on either side and continuing up into the Alaskan Arctic. Um, and so we're, we're constantly monitoring, you know, when, when we analyze our recorders, we also analyze for uh, vessel noise presence as well. Um, and so, yeah, so we're, we're, it's, it's definitely a, a concern that we keep an eye on for it and we, we monitor and, and analyze for vessel noise. So, uh, you know, we'll be able to, to see if there's a noticeable impact um, on right well detections in, in those areas. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. You know, we'd love to get you back as, as you guys are learning more. I, I wanna thank, uh, you, Jessica, in particular, but also just the, the NOAA Fisheries um, Science Center for with right whales kind of bringing the news back to the north and, and also recognizing the sort of the northward creep and the sightings and stuff. So that is really a, a, a so refreshing for this region and uh, you pulled it off with a plum. So we are gonna have a uh, break this next week for Iditarod. So the racers are on their way and um, Charlie was telling me they're on a 24 hour layover right now. They're, they're quiet period right now. So probably a lot of strategizing. And then of course they'll enter into Nome here in about five days or so. Um, the week after that on the 24th, we will have Mike Cameron with the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. He's gonna be talking about some ice seal research that's ship based and will be in the Northern Bering Sea uh, this later this spring. So tune in for that. And Jessica, again, thank you so much. Great presentation.